Hello everyone and welcome to this video tutorial in which we're going to be looking at the OCR exam format for the Lawmaking and Law of Contract exam. So I've switched my screens here so you can see we're now looking at the OCR A-level law, Nature of Law and Law of Contract paper. And this is the sample question paper that OCR provide to help you prepare for the exam. And we're going to be taking a look at the exam format and the sorts of content that you would put in the sample questions provided. So for this exam, you would have two hours to answer a total of four questions. And the total mark for this paper is out of 80. On section A, you need to answer one question using examples and you get a choice of two to answer there. And on section B, you need to choose either part one or part two and then answer the three questions below it. But that will make a bit more sense as we scroll through the paper. So let's start by taking a look at section A and section A on this paper is on the nature of law and you need to answer one question here from a choice of two and you'll see that they're worth 20 marks. So question one says the law should enforce morality, discuss the extent to which you agree with this statement. And I think this is a really nice, interesting question that's asking you to distinguish between um, law and morals and to evaluate whether it's appropriate for the law to reflect and enforce morality. Um, and to start answering that well, you need to start with a definition of legal rules. And you could go with John Salmon, John Austin, Hart, Carl Llewellyn here. Um, for definitions of morals, you might talk about Durkheim or Philip Harris. And then you'd need to talk about the fact that sometimes we do legally enforce moral values. And you could give some examples of laws that do enforce morals, such as human rights or any examples from common law or statute um, that you think are particularly interesting. And then you should talk about the diversity of moral views in a pluralist society. So the difficulty is that we all have very different views on what's right and wrong, um, and that can make it difficult or challenging for the law to enforce morality. And you could talk about abortion law as an example of that, where there's a clear divide between people um, who would put themselves in the right to choose camp versus people who say that right to life and abortion should be illegal. So you can talk about examples of controversial laws made by parliament and judges and discuss how morality changes over time. So, for example, marital rape wasn't a crime until 1991. Um, and you could maybe touch on the Hart Devlin debate using examples of laws supporting Devlin and laws which support Hart. You could also talk about the relationship between law and morals and its importance. So really nice opportunity to talk about theories of law and morals, such as natural law theorists like Aristotle and Aquinas um, and positivists like Bentham and the overlap between law and mor morals and the divergence of laws and morals. But there should really be quite a big emphasis on the difficulty of defining moral values and the law struggling to please everyone. You could use the law on euthanasia and pretty in the UK there. Um, and you could discuss, you know, the, the political aspect, how politicians may avoid passing controversial laws that will divide society and could change the way that people vote. Um, and also talk about um, judges being out of touch potentially and struggling to keep up with the views um, of society um, and them tending co to come from a very narrow social background and how that might affect um, issues of morality. The alternative question here, if you didn't like the look of question one, question two asks you um, to discuss the extent to which the aim of the law should be to achieve justice. And as always, to answer this well, you should start with a definition. Um, and so when you're defining justice, you could talk about the different types of justice that are available, whether it be formal, substantive, distributive and corrective justice and give examples of each. And you could also include theories of law and justice here. 
So the natural law theorists that you could have talked about in question one would also be relevant in this question. So talking about Aristotle, Aquinas, Fuller, positivists such as Bentham, Hart and Austin. You could talk about the rule of law, Marxism, but try and make sure that you're giving examples of the different types of justice that you're talking about. So, for example, examples of formal justice would include legal institutions such as the police, the courts, the judiciaries, whereas substantive justice, the different legal rules, for example, fault and defences in criminal law, and giving examples of distributive justice, such as the fair allocation of resources, thinking about aspects such as wealth and power. And with corrective justice, talking about how sentencing can reflect our different aims, such as retribution um, and remedies in the law of tort and contract. Again, just like with question one, you really need to evaluate the difficulty with the law trying to create a common definition of justice that's going to be shared by all members of society and talk about some of the problems with the different types of justice that you've identified. So for formal justice, you could talk about problems faced by the criminal justice system and give examples from miscarriage of justice cases. You could talk about the Runciman Commission, um, Stephen Lawrence case findings and the McPherson report. With substantive justice, discuss different legal rules and whether they actually achieve justice or not. And with distributive justice, talking about how the law struggles to create justice for everyone, regardless of class, wealth, gender, race and disability, and how this can potentially lead to in, uh, inequality such as anti-discrimination laws for workers, tax evasion for rich corporations, etc. And with corrective justice, discussion of high reoffending rates, which sort of question really the effectiveness um, of some of the sentences that we give and the inequality of bargaining power that you have in a lot of civil cases. So that was section A. Let's scroll down to our next section, section B. And remember that for this particular section, you either choose part one, which is on this page, or you choose part two, which is on the following page. So you will need to scan the questions quite quickly in the exam to work out whether you like the look of this one or whether you prefer the look of this question. And you really need to think about which you think you'll be able to score the highest marks on. So on part one, you've got two little scenarios followed by two questions which are based on the scenario and then an essay question on intention to create legal relations. And on the part two, it's the exact same format in that you've got two little scenarios two questions based on the scenarios and notice that the essay question is exactly the same. It's on intention to create legal relations. So you can't escape the essay question if you like. The difference is going to be what's happening in the scenarios. Have a brief look at what you're being asked to do on the part one section. The first scenario is a classic consideration scenario in contract law where you've got a character called Danny who owns a cafe and he makes a number of promises to Lucy and Sarah and you're being asked to advise whether Lucy and Sarah have given good consideration for his promises so that they can be legally enforced. So to answer that question three well, you would need to start by explaining the rules on consideration and I've got a separate video on my channel on the rules of consideration which you can have a look at um, and then you would need to apply them back to Lucy and Sarah and I would always start with the characters in the order that they appear in the scenario so start by considering the promises made to Lucy. So firstly Danny promises Lucy a bonus if she works a bit harder because another member of staff has become unwell. So you'd be discussing there whether Lucy is performing an obligation which is significantly different or more difficult when she does Bill's work and conclude that she probably isn't as she's performing a generic task of being a waiter. Um, so that's showing the rule that an existing contractual obligation to work as a waiter 
isn't usually going to be unforceable. It's not good consideration. But you should also consider whether Danny obtains some benefit or avoids a detriment when he offers Lucy extra money to continue working alone. And he probably does because he avoids the need to hire an extra waiter. You'd then talk about the Lucy and Sarah situation and identify that Sarah's consideration is past at the time that Danny offers to pay her for making the deliveries and consider whether Sarah was acting at Danny's request. It doesn't look perhaps that she was um, as she offered to make the deliveries anyway. The other question, question four, is based on this scenario involving Sanji. In this scenario, you would need to be talking about um, the false statements that have been made regarding the car um, and that this could amount to misrepresentation, um, which would allow the other party to rescind the contract. So you'd need to talk about um, the statutory regulation of contract terms under the Consumer Rights Act 2015 and the statutory regulation of insurance contracts under the Consumer Insurance Disclosure and Representations Act 2012. And because Sanjeet is a consumer, the contract would be regulated by the consumer rights legislation. Jeff would have a duty to point out any differences between the display model and the model that Sanjeet was ordering. And Sanjeet would have the right to reject the car, provided that he exercises that right within 30 days. And that at common law, Jeff has made a false statement when he represented that the car on display would be similar to the car that Sanjeet was ordering. And so Sanjeet would have the right to rescind the contract for misrepresentation unless he's affirmed the contract by using the car with knowledge of the discrepancy. And in terms of the insurance, Sanjeet was not aware that the insurance company would have wanted to know about the accident. And so his statement was not deliberately made and that the insurance company did not ask about previous accidents. And so the statement is just likely to be seen as careless. Now, in terms of the essay question, I do have a separate video that goes through an answer to that on my channel. Um, so I won't go through it here. Um, instead, we'll just have a look at the alternative part two and what the other questions were that you could have opted for. On part two, question six refers to this classic offer and acceptance question involving Dylan and Ella. And question seven is all about frustration. Um, and that comes from this scenario involving a company called Abacus. In terms of offer and acceptance, you'd need to talk about um, the communication between Dylan and Ella and the fact that Ella hasn't given any consideration for the offer to keep um, the offer open until Tuesday and that his offer will remain open until it's been revoked or accepted. Um, and Ella seeing the picture might amount to revocation of the offer. And you'd need to talk about at what point the email takes effect, talking about the postal rule there and talk about the issues also with Dylan and Wendy and that the offer and acceptance is communicated and effective during the phone call and that Dylan's attempt to revoke the offer is going to be ineffective as revocation cannot take place after the acceptance has already happened. And so therefore, there's a binding contract between Dylan and Wendy, which has been breached. For question seven, please see the other videos on my channel on how to apply the law on frustration. But you would need to be talking about the Law Reform Frustrated Contracts Act 1943 and Section 1-2, talking about where money paid in advance of a frustrating event may be reclaimed minus just expenses. And Section 1-3, where a party has to account for any valuable benefit that they would have gained because of the frustrating event. With Abacus and Beaches, you could talk about the fact it's still possible to perform the contract with Beaches because there was no means of performance specified in the contract and an increase in cost won't frustrate the contract, so it's not going to be frustrated. With Abacus and Sportius, identify that the fire is likely to be a frustrating event as performance of the contract has become impossible and that under statute, Sportius is entitled to have the money paid before the frustration returned to him 
and abacus are entitled to retain just expenses, um, which is a matter of discretion.